This is Jesse Hensley. This is Josh Turner. And this is Chris Bow. Welcome to Turn Down for What. Turn Down for What. We have another great episode for everybody today. Um, excited to kind of go back. We've been having several episodes uh, in a row, really heavily dialoguing around the Cybertruck. Uh, we've done a lot of conversation around the Lightning. Uh, sprinkled in a little bit of the Porsche Taycan in there, but a lot of uh, mobility solutions on the ground. And so, uh, you know, we had a we had the privilege of having uh, Ian with Whisper Arrow on the podcast several months back. Um, but um, all, as always, something that Jesse and I have interest in and a passion in and something that we're currently working in with Power Up America um, is the advanced air mobility space. Um, and so in that, there's a lot of exciting updates and um, some things that just, you know, I, I think it's a under spotlighted industry. A lot of there's a lot of national attention given to the EV industry and charging networks and the funding mechanisms. But, you know, the as I've gotten more and more into the advanced air mobility space, um, it's just amazing to see some of the technologies and some of the updates from around the globe that is happening uh, in the advanced air mobility space with hydrogen airplanes and EV, uh, EV talls, which is the vertical takeoff and landing uh, craft. And they even have some that are traditional takeoff and landing um, that they're working on developing, getting FAA certifications, um, which a company like Whisper is working for the propulsion technologies for. Um, but we have the wonderful privilege of having Dan um, on the line today. Um, Dan is actually, um, and I'll let him do a full introduction on himself, but he is um, the CEO of a company that we're partnered with, uh, Velatus uh, Infrastructure. Um, and they deal with specifically the charging networks and the helipad, you know, so sources to basically the infrastructure for the future of regional mobility and some of those solutions. Um, but... You are also um, the, uh, give us the title again, of the Advanced Air Mobility Institute. Uh, yes, thank you, Josh. I'm the founder and board president of the Advanced Air Mobility Institute. Uh, we are a 501c3 international nonprofit research center. Um, in fact, uh, just here in January, we hosted our inaugural Global AAM Forum. Um, we, we, we had uh, liaisons from all the world uh, as many now as 43 countries represented. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's crazy to think that not only is this an industry that we don't know much about as, as, a, as a nation and as, you know, the average person doesn't know much about, but to know that there's 43 different countries actually looking at this industry and what that what that means for them. Um, so obviously, I think with uh, in our conversations, you had a recent uh, lecture that you did at the University of Arkansas. Am I correct? That's correct. That's correct. Got a chance to uh, to, to join for uh, the the uh, class taught by one of our senior advisors, uh, Dr. Nalakshi, um, in their graduate engineering program. Uh, and the students there had a lot of fantastic questions, a lot of really good insights. Uh, and it's exciting to see how the younger generation is, you know, really thinking um, creatively about how they can be involved and, and being engaged in this space. Absolutely. Well, um, I'm going to give you the floor and let you give us a few minutes of, you know, thoughts, conversations, things that excite you about the industry. Obviously, I think yesterday uh, you published uh, a article kind of giving a summary of some of the updates from around the globe. Uh, give us some fun tidbits of what is kind of exciting in the space today and kind of some of the, the cool things going on in your world. Absolutely. So, yes, we did. We we published a summary report from the forum. Uh, this was um, really kind of the, 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 the purpose for our board of liaisons is an opportunity, a, a platform to share best practices among uh, UAS and eVTOL experts from around the world. Um, this idea of, you know, it's an evolving public sentiment. Uh, communities around the world have very different um, preconceived notions, uh, different uh, firsthand experiences with these technologies. Um, naturally, some people are worried about, for example, uh, privacy. 
uh, right? Drones can be in the wrong hands. Uh, they, they can um, they can infringe on on, on privacy, uh, and um, it's something that it's important to us to address. Uh, so we looked to our liaisons to kind of help us stay abreast, right? Even if there was a a major protest um, in, in in Malawi, let's say. Um, unfortunately, it's unlikely that a headline like that would reach uh, the United States. Um, but uh, our liaisons help us uh, maintain awareness, in particular because uh, it's kind of on both ends of the spectrum, right? If if there are if there's a you know outpouring of negative uh, emotion, a, a protest or demonstration then um, that's an opportunity for us to to look a bit closer. Uh, it, it could be as simple as the the community, there's this lack of awareness or education. Um, so then we can tap into our senior advisors, uh, of which I believe at last count, we have as many as 70. Um, and, and these are uh, sourced from around the world, uh, many of which have uh, master's and, and doctoral degrees um, in, in niches specific to this space. Um, uh, so if it's a lack of awareness, we can we can draft a uh, paper and do original research to help alleviate those concerns. Um, but other times, uh, it's certainly possible that these will be real uh, threats uh, to to rights like privacy. Um, there's even, you know, as as much as you hate to say, uh, eVTOLs could be an excellent tool for human trafficking. Um, because they're easier to fly, cheaper to uh, purchase head to head with uh, conventional helicopters anyway. Um, and, and of course, them being much more quiet, um, that that lower that lower noise uh, profile will make uh, crossing border walls uh, pretty easy. So this is a space that's uh, it, it, it will uh, it will kind of ebb and flow uh, over time. A, a lot of changes, as you all know, uh, Josh. And uh, but we also look to them to share to the extent that they're you know they're positive uh, instances, right? I mean, if we could be so lucky, a celebration or even a parade. Um, these tools are being used in different parts of the planet. Uh, to to uh, support inefficient search and rescue missions, right? Uh, especially through use of uh, thermal imaging. Uh, I mean, we can we can find lost persons much much more quickly than we used to historically, and that I think you can uh, quite easily see a community rallying around, right? Uh, maybe a maybe a a, a, a small uh, boy or girl has gone missing uh, out on a hike, lost their way. Um, that would certainly be cause to celebrate. Uh, and so we want to use our platform to help promote uh, and amplify uh, stories like that um, and to make sure that uh, that that we can help support the strategic communications, uh, make sure that people are aware of all the various benefits. And, and in that way, we can create a bit of the uh, the demand pull. Uh, right. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to reach, you know, mass adoption if if people don't aren't even aware that uh, all the good that it can do, especially in a public safety capacity. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that, you know, a lot of times you can see, you know, on a generic scale. Hey, there's a there's a viable solution. And this is a unique thing. I mean, it's like you're saying the the future of regional mobility as we're exploring it in the United States has a great use case for air taxis and moving people around urban areas. Um, it's more quiet. Um, it's more considerate. Uh, mm -hmm. It is cheaper um, to uh, move these uh, vehicles because jet fuel is uh, so much more expensive than electric uh, for these solutions. But there's also going to be challenges around the globe and, and within our own nation in regards to the use case of these products. Uh, one of the things we've been speaking to a few state representatives uh, across the board have been, well, now you use these goods, you know, these these um, aircraft for goods and tra uh, services to, for transfer. How do you track what's being moved? If you take it off the roads in a tractor trailer where that's easier to track down the roadways, now you bring the, the mobility into the skies or this regional mobility up and down in the 
the taxing of it. And I mean, there's just so much extra consideration and legislation and, and things that have to take place around the space that is just, um, it's all in its infancy stage. And so there's a lot of considerations. And, um, you know, if you have 10 drones in the sky, how are they communicating with each other to not run into each other? If they are these automated uh, AI type, you know, aircraft and, you know, they're talking about future drone deliveries uh, from in, into regional areas to deliver packages, which is a huge application. I mean, they're currently already on the West Coast doing it for some Domino's pizza deliveries, uh, <laughs> dropping the Domino's on your front door. Um, and th those things are all, you know, drones and, and smaller, you know, use cases are already in play. But how do you how do you regulate that uh, in a space that's not really super regulated? Um, and so that's, that's, there's a lot of considerations of things, especially globally, like you're saying, um, with the implications of how to navigate that, not only on a national scale, but on a global scale. You're exactly well, right. Yeah. Yeah. And the cost, let me just throw a cost out there. So I was fortunate enough to be around a, a, a large, one of these companies that do EV tolls that came into our local airport about two weeks ago. And the question was asked, how much does it cost for power to operate this aircraft per hour? And earlier, I had thought that it was around the 70 to $60 an hour mark is what the, the actual cost was. And I think everybody was surprised when he turned around to us and said $7 an hour. Um, and that is a very large aircraft that, uh, yeah, again, once you start taking two passengers, now, again, you don't have 2,000 pounds on this vehicle, which that's what kind of they're looking at for goods and services. But once you start considering that on traditional means, the 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 fuel would have been around three to $400 per hour for that same vehicle. Now you can start understanding that this technology isn't just going to revolutionize how people get around, but it's also going to revolutionize how much you have to pay to get your goods and services from Amazon and from UPS and from FedEx. You know, going to back to Josh's point, it, it's not only in California, drone delivery systems are being tested in Memphis, Tennessee right now. So yeah. these systems that are out there, uh, though they can like any technology can be utilized in military applications as well. The reason that it's great for everybody in our situation is the benefits financially that it brings not only that but if you need medicine like you were talking about one of the aspects that we're talking with with different partners in the state is not only the aspect of here is a drone or here is a, a regional air mobility program but also what happens if there is a mountain fire how can you get somebody up there to see it if you have a child that's lost in the mountains with with thermal imaging how do you go out there and find that person how do you do it without knowing you know, where you're looking, because you can't have somebody controlling it and looking where AI can have that possibility, because the AI industry has allowed what's called the Internet of Things to come into these situations and really drastically uh, benefit people. It's just the application. And I think that's the other part of this. When when people who don't know what the advanced air mobility ecosystem is, please go out and search companies like WISC. Uh, WISC for Aero was one of our partners here in Tennessee. Joby, uh, Archer, um, uh, Beta, you know, all of these companies, once you go out and search their names and see what they're building, it gives you an idea that that type of technology is just over, over the horizon within just a year or two. And the work that you're doing, Dan, is laying the footprints and, and the foundations of what do we need to answer before we integrate that into society? Because all it's going to do is make for a quicker, easier, more efficient way for you to get what you want at a cheaper cost. And I think there's not really anybody that can argue that's not a good thing to have happen. And the conversation that we had with Ian when he was uh, visiting us, um, you know, that was basically the the opportunity to to bring remote areas into job opportunities in an urban area through efficient, um, cheaper uh, air mobility uh, gives you the opportunity to, you know, expand networks, 
uh, bring in jobs to where rural areas can have more of an impact because if an air taxi can take you into town and back out of town for 50 bucks, but you can go from a $20,000 a year job to a $80,000 a year job, well, that's an efficient, that's an efficient way to uh, provide regional mobility. And it's not just from airport to airport. You're looking at solutions that can then take you from you land at an airport and you're going to a concert in the middle of a downtown. You can actually take, you know, one of those air taxis to that platform or you would show up to an air taxi location at, you know, one part of a region and be able to go uh, to a different uh, part of the region based on demand. And so these these smaller term solutions for package delivery, um, but also for people moving uh, on a small scale um, is is a huge use case to expand regional mobility. Uh, but also when you look at some of the larger applications for some of the hydrogen aircraft and things, it makes a more efficient, uh, more cost effective uh, use case to get, you know, m more quantity people uh, transported, um, which would then lower the cost of airfare or I guess imp improve the bottom lines of the uh, of the companies uh, moving people. So, so I'm, I'm curious. The um, most of what I've seen, you know, you see a lot of drones, and you see them in real estate a lot. Um, we we had out here in in California with our wildfires. Um, our our local fire department has this awesome Rivian that in the um, in the gear tunnel they have a drone set up. And they can recharge their drone batteries and get it up in the air really quickly and, and look at the fire lines and get into the, the trails and into the hills and into the areas they need to. So I, I've seen that. That stuff is is really great. And then there's this kind of the, the leap to the bigger, though, is kind of my curiosity because, um, you know, with, with FedEx uh, and disclosure, uh, all opinions are my own, not speaking for the company, et cetera. But um, we have a lot of what we call feeder aircraft and these are two engine prop planes uh, <laughs> that feed our larger hubs. And these go from smaller satellite stops into our bigger hubs. And then eventually they get onto the jets that kind of fly further, whether it's worldwide countrywide, that kind of stuff. But we have a lot a huge fleet of what are called feeder aircraft um, where, where those would seem to be a natural first step, or there's a company out here called uh, JSX, which uses kind of almost private jet looking jets, you know, maybe eight to 12 people that regularly go from the Bay area to Los Angeles, Bay area to Reno Bay area to Vegas. And those are, again, those kind of seems like natural first steps and that kind of thing. How much of these, you know, are aspirational, um, and can be really realized in, in then what time frame? I, it, how close are these to to really being deployed with with people in them versus kind of you know uh, an amazing concept car you might see at a car show, but never really comes to reality? Can you kind of speak to that and kind of where you think that that sits? Because I'll a let big that answer the from, question. But Jesse, yeah. which provider was it that's already ordered the Archer aircraft? Was it UPS or was it FedEx? Or Amazon. I, I, it was one of the three. It is UPS, I believe, has announced that they have purchased Archer, but I have not. I, I have to confirm that. One of the providers has actually already purchased a small fleet to give it a give it a test run. Um, so, I mean, it's already in certification, but I'll let Dan answer the question about uh, what he knows about that. Sure, certainly. Uh, excellent question, Christopher. Um, and, and in fact, um, I, I recently uh, joined as a contributing writer for Rob Report. Um, so uh, th they have me putting together a number of these lists. Uh, in, in fact, uh, next next one on the docket will be uh, one that reviews a lot of these um, these upcoming hybrid and electric um, uh, cargo uh, aircraft. Uh, one in particular, you mentioned JSX. Uh, they are, in fact, getting into this space. Um, in fact, uh, they recently announced uh, a purchase of up to uh, 100 of um, Hart Aerospace ES30. Um, this is uh, it's it, it's uh, capable of, of accommodating 30 seats, uh, but so it certainly can be configured for for cargo, just like you're describing. Um, this is uh, there's so much potential uh, in terms of, of cargo. 
Um, and I think that's natural, right? Uh, for for any new technology that's going to transport people, um, you know, no one wants to be a guinea pig, uh, right? So uh, as we're as we're looking to you know prove up uh, the the consistency and 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 safety of these vehicles. Uh, I'm certainly in favor that we put, you know, whether it's UPS or FedEx, you know, any kind of packages or parcels, uh, let's have those, uh, you know, uh, be put aboard uh, the, the the new uh, aircraft. Um, but yeah, JSX is very much getting into this space. Um, there's there, there's lots. Heart uh, uh, Aerospace in particular, uh, they're based out of uh, Sweden. Um, uh, the, the Scandinavian countries are very, very much embracing electric mobility in all of its forms. Um, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Norway is pretty darn close to, um, ha having fully replaced fossil fuel, uh, uh, vehicles. Norway is kind of the gold standard when it comes to that kind of thing, right? Hey, I mean, and they just got the F one hundred and fifty Lightning, so they're even cooler. So <laughs> they, they did, they did. They, yeah, there was just some uh, roaming Norway who I always just uh, follow and cyber stock because they have the coolest posts out there. And uh, had the F one hundred and fifty one that had been kind of rebuilt, I think, in Germany. He said where the charge port door on the right hand side was being used, and it was plugged into a Tesla charger. You know, because because they're so much better unified out there, and um, Tesla runs the CCS two or whatever they run out there in Europe. So, um, very much you know easier to to be integrated, which kind of <clears throat> leads me to two more questions about in in the aerospace, which is one: is it uh, standardized? Is there like an SAE standardized plug that everybody in the industry is is using? And then when it comes to batteries, you you famously think of Norway being cold, Canada being cold, and we always hear feedback about in those cold conditions, the range loss, the ability for uh, um, batteries to to lose their capacity and charge. Well, you know when you're up thirty thousand feet in the air, it's cold. Um, like what's what's that like, and how's that working out and being tested, and how's that dealt with? Yes. So um, first, uh, let, let me make sure I I, I give due credit. Uh, um, JSX also uh, has placed an order for for Electra uh, with their elect their electric short takeoff uh, and landing uh, transport vehicles as well. Um, Electra is another um, original equipment manufacturer uh, that that's doing a lot of exciting things in this space. Um, but to your question, Christopher, uh, you know for for um, markets that are, are consistently uh, colder, longer winters, um, we actually still have a lot more research to do, especially when it comes to what is the impact of, of icing, um, right, on these uh, multi-copter lift and cruise uh, vehicles. Um, <clears throat> And, and that naturally uh, leads to, um, th as far as adoption uh, in, in the United States, it's kind of all eyes on Orlando at the moment. Um, th they're on track uh, to be one of the first cities in the country. Uh, Dallas has a lot of potential as well. Um, certainly uh, Southern California, um, as, as, Jesse, as Jesse mentioned, you've got... Um, you've got Archer, Joby, Overair, um, uh, and a number of others uh, based there in California. Um, yet to see if California, based on its the the, the uh, legal regulatory environment, uh, where uh, whether they will, while they're producing them there, uh, it's hard to say whether or not they will actually uh, begin flying them there. Um, although uh, they do seem to be embracing uh, and, and uh, committing, well, investing money in uh, building up the hydrogen infrastructure. Uh, so so that's quite interesting. Um, but uh, it, it's, uh, I'm confident that we can get there. Uh, but certainly that the warmer climates uh, are, are more conducive because uh, they don't have those additional complications. And let me throw this out there. I was incorrect. It appears the only uh, company that Beta 
or the only company UPS has publicly acknowledged is a collaboration with Beta Technologies, which is the one that I, I got the view as well. So Beta is one of the companies that they are uh, licensed to test the electric vehicles for deliveries at this point. So that's the only one that's publicly been mentioned to today. Now, one other aspect that people don't realize is the ability to do a hybrid system. So this is a takeoff uh, a system to where you have the jets or the, the electric propulsion getting you into the atmosphere, and then you can switch over to traditional means or even vice versa. You use the um, you use the traditional means to get into the air, and then your cruising would be electric. And so far, and 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 from what I've been told, that is also an area that could have a big impact. You are saving a lot of fuel doing it that way. So much like we we are talking about the options, you know, and how on the vehicle side we're looking at hybrids. That's also being considered for uh, aircraft as well. So um, again, it, it, it's all spectrums. You know, I'm, I'm kind of fond of hydrogen. That is something that there's been releasing of uh, uh, aircraft that utilizes hydrogen fuel cell technology that can get, you know, 1200 miles range with 100 or 350 miles an hour for top speed for a tradition. I think there's some F1 uh, engineers that's working on that side of it as well. So there's not only on the drone side, uh, but every aspect of the air mobility uh, community is kind of represented. So then it gets into, Dan, what I'm going to ask you, what do you see as what infrastructures are uh, infrastructure updates are needed in order to support the advanced air mobility sector? So the the. Um, the, the infrastructure that's required, certainly we need uh, an awful lot more investment uh, in, in um, growing capacity for our, for our national grid. Um, <clears throat> it certainly wasn't uh, designed uh, in, um, you know, from the beginning to be able to support this, this uh, extent, uh, right? Electric mobility wasn't really uh, conceived. Uh, as something uh, to support. Um, although, uh, you look back historically, um, the, the idea of an electric car uh, is far from new. Um, you know, there's some uh, some some interesting models that were, were put forth, uh, and unfortunately, just didn't quite catch on um, back then. But um, yes, we, we need an awful lot more uh, infrastructure uh, to be able to support the charging um, in fact, I, I I came across an article that was explaining, I believe it's for for the average neighborhood in the United States anyway, um, if 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 that neighborhood uh, had uh, up to even just seven electric vehicles charging at one time, that would pretty well max out the capacity. Um, so we're we're. I think already seeing uh, a bit of uh, saturation uh, already kind of topping out. Um, and let me, let me take the opportunity to uh, tie back in uh, Christopher, uh, you'd asked about, um, you know, is, does there seem to be, if I understood correctly, uh, please, uh, you know, let me know if I misunderstood, but you were asking about, does there seem to be some consensus coming together for the electric charging protocol? Right. Was that, yeah, so this is an especially interesting topic, um, you know, when it when, when it comes to uh, electric aviation. Um, there, so the the General Aviation Manufacturers Association Gamma, um, they they put together a um, a report that uh, that that advocates for uh, adoption of. Uh, the CCS protocol. Um, there, there's quite a number of uh, stakeholders that that support that, and it, and from we what we've been seeing, FAA does seem to be supporting that uh, that that protocol as well. Um, the reason that's particularly uh, you know salient uh, point right now is that uh, in many ways the the the, the leader in the U.S. Uh, manufacturing for these EVTOLs, Joby, um, they have developed their their own 
uh, protocol. Um, it's known as the Global Electric Aviation Charging System. Um, I think I, I actually haven't heard a definitive pronunciation. Uh, I've heard GX. GX. Yeah, <laughs> GX. Yeah. Um, they took Dax. They took Nax and had to be fancy with it, and they were like, "Let's let's make it a uh, GX." Yeah, yeah. So um, it'll be very interesting to see. I think I think most people agree that um, to the extent that we can, uh, you know, come together with with uh, you know consensus, this is Evitals are inherently intrust city. Uh, intrastate, uh, of course, out here in New England, uh, you know, we make the states much smaller. So, um, you know, the uh, it, it's certainly uh, foreseeable that that beta, for example, out of Vermont, um, you know, they, they will regularly be making uh, interstate uh, trips. But um, it's not like traditional aviation where we need, you know, global consensus. Um I think we can get by uh, just fine so long as there are national standards uh, in place. Certainly, it, to the extent U.S. and Canada um, can, you know, can can agree on a single standard. Uh, ideally, Europe's able to agree on one, but they don't necessarily; those two don't necessarily need to be the same. Um, because you know, eVTOLs just by their very nature and, and range limitations, they're not going to be crossing oceans. Yeah. And I, I think that in our discussions, I mean, the one thing that we're trying to avoid as infrastructure providers to airports is we don't want uh, another uh, what's happening on the roadways where you're the, the federal funds have pushed out CCS and CCS is a means to an end because all the dealerships and the OEMs are moving to NACs. Um and so, you know, the, the federal pushed out their funding and now a lot of them have pivoted in making that you do use CCS and NAX. But in five years, all the new vehicles pretty much across the board with all manufacturers will be NAX. Um, and so the Tesla network will be the future of the uh, the vehicle industry. But there's this dichotomy. You're, you're dealing with Chatmo on its way out. CCS is the current standard, which is already moving to NAX. And in the aviation spectrum where there is no robust charging infrastructure, now's the time to jump ahead and say, let's agree on a standard. Uh, that way we're not having to install three different heads at every airport because that's just not practical. And adapters when you're coming to high powered infrastructure doesn't make any sense. Um, and the other thing, which you can back me up on the stand, but it seems like um, and this is something I think that the larger trucking industry and stuff will manage, but rather than have high powered single output you're seeing a lot of these airplanes have multiple different connections um either at a time or um subsequent to each other to charge different modules of the battery um that way it allows for a spread out charging network so basically one cord would come in and, and there would be three or four different uh, ccs hookups that would discharge power into multiple different locations of the battery where I, from what I understand, GEACS <laughs> was basically their intention was to split through one load with a cooling um, aspect of uh, running in and out of the actual line itself. Yeah, certainly. And and I think it's important that we take time to at least attempt to future proof uh, a lot of this infrastructure. Um, I mean, there's already talk about um, trying to stand up full megawatt. Uh, charging, uh, and, and that will require, of course, um, you know, proportionally high, um, uh, greater levels of of cooling necessary. Yeah, and, I mean that's something kind of... that well, I think I think it it makes much more sense to have, you know, for, for instance, in the megawatt instance, it's much easier to have two units discharging five hundred into two different parts, uh, two different plugs rather than be dealing with one single megawatt discharge because the electrical infrastructure for that kind of delivery is just so much more um, intense. And you can discharge off batteries and try to figure out a way to, to make that work. But it seems like in the trucking industry where you're dealing with larger scale EV batteries um, and in the aviation industry, I think it, the solution makes more sense to have multiple discharge points uh, discharging lower spectrums of power. That way it's a little it's more spread out across the demand load. 
and kind of talking about that thermal management and, and kind of back to the, the question earlier a bit, the the temperature, it's not just on the ground in, in a state like New England or, or in Norway, Canada, that kind of thing. But also once you get to altitude with these larger aircraft, um, not even necessarily transatlantic flights, but even just regionally, you're still getting up to, you know, 20, mid 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet in, this, in the air. I don't know if it's different with, with this aviation, but I would think for air traffic control and jet streams and everything and the, the stability of the air, there's still kind of a, a bracket that you kind of ideally want to be in. And it, and it just naturally gets cold the higher you go. Um, and I know like with our, with our cargo, it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, temperature controlled, it, you know, unless there's a specific need for it. And most of the containers, it's, it's cold. And it's not just icing on the wings, which is a problem, of course, but um, those battery cells where they live and reside, even with insulation, it's still cold and you've got to thermal manage that. And um, how's that been going or testing is um, I got to imagine that limits to some degree, the range. And, um, and that's where you get into, you know, Jesse's love of hydrogen versus the weight of batteries. Yeah. Um, no, like, what I would does that say, look like? I would say EV tells us as a, as a current solution, aren't high flying um, aircraft. Um, a lot of those are regional, um, low flying puddle hoppers that are not probably getting more than five, 10,000 feet. Um, but you know, the, the future solutions and I'm Dan can speak to this, but I'm sure that the future solutions will have to have some significant thermo, um, considerations for the heating and solutions, just like with our lightnings. Um, you know, they didn't put a heat pump in our, in our, vehicles and we get significant yeah. range loss but yep. the new vehicles will have a heat pump circulating uh, and keeping that battery warm for best efficiency and that's going to be mandated when you're taking vehicles up to zero degree temperatures and stuff up in the the upper altitudes uh, for efficiency <laughs> of long-term flights but i think that that's something that i don't i don't i don't know of any of the current aircraft providers that these are talking about going 100 miles max at probably uh, i would guess probably 10,000 uh, feet altitude and you're not seeing those high 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 altitudes but even at five or ten thousand feet there is a temperature difference but i think that's a thermodynamic management with appropriate heat heat pumps and, and systems keeping that battery warm and insulation and otherwise yes uh, josh is exactly right so what we touched on earlier as far as uh, you know part aerospace electra um for for e-stall CTOL, conventional takeoff and landing. Um, I, I fully expect that we'll see uh, some of the you know altitude ranges that uh, that you referenced, Christopher. Um, but as far as the eVTOL, uh, many of them are, were designed in particular to stay within the same city um, of origin, um, right? So they certainly don't need to climb to the kind of altitude um, that would have you know, major temperature um, uh, implications. Um, <clears throat> part of what's uh, what, what's interesting about this uh, space, you know, you, you, your point about um, uh, temperatures impact on the, uh, you, you know, the, the respective range of these vehicles. It's definitely an important consideration. In fact, we have, um, so I, I don't think I shared, um, I, I am a licensed private pilot, right? And in, in general aviation, um, you know, FAA has determined, um, you know, anytime you take off, you need at least uh, 30 minutes uh, in reserve uh, beyond your intended destination, right? In case there's any kind of issues. Uh, and 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 of course, I I agree that that's a a good um, <clears throat> a good way to make sure that you know you can reach a safe uh, divert airport as needed. Um, transitioning to electric for these eVTOLs, um, there's kind of a question on well, how do we you know we've we we set that based on thirty minutes uh, of fuel right. Um, if it's, if it's, if we use the same parameter and re require 30 minutes, uh, reserve on the electric battery, uh, there are an awful lot of EVTOL manufacturers who that's the entirety 
of their uh, capacity for those batteries, right? Um, so what's tough, of course, is, is you know, do we, do we lower that uh, for this new technology? That doesn't sound particularly appealing, um, but, uh, but, but you're exactly right. Um, to, to the extent that these are operating in colder environments, um, that's going to be yet another pinch on, on their endurance. Seems like with VTOL, you would need a different category for that, though, because um, I I was a <laughs> private pilot in the early 2000s, uh, Cessna 172s. And, you know, you would practice soft field landings and you'd, you know, look at different areas for diverting. But you've got to then you're looking at gliding. You're looking at, you know, the amount of runway length and trying to figure out, you know, what kind of surface can you land on safely and how do you practice that? Yeah, VTOL is totally different. I just, you know, I don't need to to find a long landing strip. I don't have to find the right surface with a VTOL, you know, as long as you've got some type of uh, minimal power enough to like, control your descent, you could you can land it safely. On a 50 by 50 more. square of empty land, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that thirty minute requirement is because I've got to find the not just the the clear distance for a Cessna in in that case, um, but even the the surface has to be right for me to try to land on. And with a VTOL, I mean, your options are so many more that it seems like you wouldn't need that type of reserve. It would be more the redundancies. You need to have some type of redundancy for the, for some systems that allow you to safely get enough propulsion to descend as opposed to plummet, I think, would right. Be, <laughs> right. That, that would be more the concern than time, I would think. So that'll be interesting to see how they legislate or regulate that to appropriately fit the category. Cause it really does seem more analogous to like a hot air balloon than it does to a traditional um, light aircraft, I would think. And beta beta solution is a traditional takeoff and landing. So, I mean, obviously they're, um, they're, they're going to be a little bit, different um when it comes to that um but i mean i think with some of the traditional ev tolls i mean I, I agree with you that there's there could be some additional consideration for that i don't i don't know i'm not enough uh knowledge in the field to know if helicopters abide by the same standard that um that you're referencing there dan as far as the 30 minutes reserves is that is that across the board with helicopters too you know that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm not uh, I'm not qualified uh, as a that's helicopter a pilot, <laughs> yeah. uh, so so I don't want to misspeak on. But but Christopher does make a good point. Um, <clears throat> you know certainly we, we wouldn't uh, want to land an eVTOL on a on an active roadway, um, right? It, certainly uh, not on any kind of uh, building that that wasn't designed, uh, you know, to do so, like a helipad, for example. Um, but yeah, a, a flat surface, especially in the event of emergency, um, there's certainly a lot more options. Um, so it, it will, it'll be very interesting to see what kind of reserve is required and, and in what, what unit of measurement uh, do they choose as well? Yeah. Uh, there's just a lot of a lot of various considerations, um, and that kind of ties back to the original point across nations, across states, with cargo and people transport. What's the regulations going to be? And that's something that I don't think we really have a direct answer on the the electric space. I know that there's several uh, aircraft. You may know the answer to all the different brands and their current certifications, but um, I know that there's several that are in FAA approval processes, and some of them that are allowed to be, I believe, have some test flights and they're they're doing thousands of flights. And I mean, I, I think that we're seeing it get there. And I don't think that it's going to be something that's happening tomorrow. But I think in five years, there's going to be solutions flying around that are actually doing these, um, these solutions. And I think testing is the next phase. Cargo transports and the logical next phase because it uh, can be at least lower manned uh, aircraft to get these uh, plane networks developed and figuring out what that looks like. Um, but then obviously there's a lot, a lot more research and development to be had in that field from hydrogen to electric, whether that's the regional solution or the long-term solution. A quick or, Google search. It doesn't yeah. seem like it's any, it seems like everything still says 30 minutes. Um, I tried to specify helicopter and, it didn't seem to give me a better result. I don't, that doesn't mean it's accurate uh, with my Google knowledge, but it does seem that at first glance that helicopters 
uh, still have the same 30 minute requirements. Uh, those listening in, feel free to drop a, cr- a comment and, and source if, if that is different. But if you happen to be uh, an aviation specialist and helicopters, please reach out to us. We'll have you yes. on the podcast to, yeah. uh, <laughs> to answer this question. Absolutely. Uh, right. And then some other aspects of the EV industry is the maintenance aspects. So when you start looking at how many moving parts an EV aircraft has, you're going to find that there's a lot less moving parts than a combustion engine. So what does that do? Well, it means that the certification for these parts is a lot simpler process. It means the cost to develop these programs are a lot less, even though they may be more expensive now. Now you also have the uh, less operational costs moving forward. So there's a lot of positives on that. We think that the industry as a whole will be probably geared more towards freight to begin with and then go to people. So Dan, when you look at just this year and the next year, so let's give us a two-year period here. What do you see as the evolution? When can people actually start thinking, I'm going to go from John C. Toon Airport to downtown Nashville next year? Is that something that you think could happen? And and what is the timetable that you see? Sure. Well, I, I do think it's certainly possible uh, at some point in calendar year 2025, Um you know, the, these vehicles are already being flown uh, and, and done so remotely uh, over in China, right? There's They've already taken the, the pilot uh, off board um, and, and, and building towards uh, f- full autonomy. Um, we, uh, I'm aware of a, a number of different countries uh, looking to utilize that same uh, EHANG EH216, uh, to begin uh, flights for at least in, in a you know point A to point A uh, tourism uh, use case, um, uh, and uh, you know over in Italy uh, they actually just got uh, approvals um, to begin uh, flying eVTOL uh, with passenger uh, as soon as December of this year. Um, so uh, it's 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 right around the corner. Um, uh, but, but I would say conservatively, uh, to your question, Jesse, uh, I, I would guess that that route in particular that you're referring to, uh, 2026. Yeah. It seems like a lot of these uh, manufacturers are on the brink of having that solution. And then the other piece of it, which, you know, me and you are both trying to resolve is, you know, what, what is the infrastructure solution like? Because you can't just buy an aircraft and have, oh, well, let's fly it now. Like you have to have charging infrastructure because unlike vehicles, there is really no network for aircraft charging. A lot of these providers have to fly out, fly out of their own airport, land at their own airport because there's nowhere else to go uh, test these, these aircraft. And some providers are getting some base network out there of slower chargers. Um, and, you know, we're, we're getting there. But for instance, uh, when Beta came and flew into our airport, uh, here comes a, a truck and a trailer pulling a, a generator to uh, charge up that airplane because my airport locally does not have charging infrastructure for their aircraft. And even though it's a CCS port and maybe a regular automotive charger would have worked, we don't even have one of those at our airport, even for general use. So that's something that like, you know, if what chicken or the egg, what comes first, you know, we can have the FAA certified aircraft. Great. Now it, we can fly them in Q4. Wonderful. Now, now there have to actually be a network of A to B helipads, chargers, whatever that looks like to actually allow that mobility solution to happen. And I know that our state specifically is has that in their sights is looking at, hey, we can decongest the roadways and, you know, this popular like Gatlinburg is one of the most popular tourist destinations in the United States. And so there's a ton of traffic coming in and out of there. And they're saying, how do we get cars off the road? Well, that could be a viable solution, but you have to have charging infrastructure and landing landing pads in order to make those type of things happen. So that's where well, you lot us with your infrastructure solutions and us, you know, with our charging solutions and infrastructure developments. I mean, that that's kind of one of the pieces that is required to promote the future of that. But that's, I mean, that's obviously uh, you have to take those steps before you could ever use anything down that vein. 
And we even have a group we talked to yesterday that is went through with one of our designs we've been trying to get out on the market as well. They've already got it on the market, which is great, which is a tug along trailer that has battery capacity and the and the ability to charge at 150 kVw uh, two vehicles at one time. Uh, simultaneously. Now, they had no idea to market it into the aircraft space and what does that do, but it also can be charged in a traditional CCS, say at a charging station somewhere else. So basically, you can then, if you land at an airport emergency or you land in a field or something that is near your house and now you do not have the power to take off, you know, there is options out there. It's a little expensive, but obviously if that's something that you need as a what if scenario, you know, that's going to allow you now to also charge later or, or, or be able to charge if you've had an emergency situation or if you did run into a headwind that made you have to divert to an airport that does not have charging infrastructure. Now you at least have that option to get back into the air and get where you're going. Now, a lot of the a lot of the VE tolls or EV tolls that we're talking about here, uh, everybody, is is based on getting to the airport is the big thing. Everybody can take a large jet to get to, say, Nashville. What these, the, the best use of these systems are the 40 minute ride during football season that you're going to take from that area to the football stadium. Even though it's only X amount long for that three miles or five miles you're going to take, you're going to be in, in traffic for a good 30 or 40 minutes. You would love to take an Uber. We've been that on that twenty dollars to We've get been... there, but that twenty dollars might not get you there in the time period you want. So that's the best use of this aircraft is to go hopping from that over to that event and in the region. What was that, Josh? I said we've we've taken that particular stretch of road from the airport to the stadium. Yes, a uh, hundred times and every time, day and night, it's always horrible traffic. So, yeah. uh, you know, being able to provide rather than pay $30 for an Uber to take you from the airport to the stadium. Imagine if you could pay $50, but get air dropped onto the, the stadium and not have to deal with traffic. And you're right there, ready to go. Um, no, no inconvenience of time. I would pay 20 bucks for that. Um, and if it's a five mile journey, which I think really aeronautically, it's probably three to five miles. Um, if it that's is. the only journey, it's not. I mean, you're talking about a three minute flight with a dollar of cost to the provider and electric. Um, and so it's a lot easier to provide a solution um, that's affordable for that transportation. You could have a hundred of those an hour uh, flying back and forth, whipping uh, parties of eight to 10, you know, across with some of these solutions. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, in fact, uh, these uh, air shuttle use case, right, getting to, people to and from a, a, a downtown uh, to the respective airport. That makes an awful lot of sense, uh, especially on a, uh, on a set uh, route, like an air corridor. Um, and, and I, I'm, you know, I'm a sports fan kind of across the board. Um, I, we see consistently uh, entertainment venues, sports stadiums, concert halls, and so forth they face the same logistical challenge every single time, right? How do we get thousands? Uh, sometimes, right, up in Michigan, as many as 100,000 people. Uh, we don't want to hear same... about Michigan. Nobody <laughs> nobody cares about Michigan. Don't talk about Michigan. <laughs> Roll tide and keep going. Sorry. <laughs> I knew that'd get your goat, Josh. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're trying to get a whole lot of people in the same place at the same time. Um, I'm very confident that there's plenty of people who, just like you're saying, would be willing to spend just a little bit more um, so they don't have to deal with the headache uh, of all that traffic uh, on both ends, right? Getting to and then and and then leaving. And, you know, I've thought before about how, you know, you, you kind of, I know I've done, I've kind of, you know, what I'm looking forward to most on it, you know, is, is game day, right? That's what I'm built my whole weekend around, uh, at times. Um, and to think that, uh, it's gotten to the point traffic is so frustrating, uh, that myself and plenty of other people, we would rather leave before the games decided right before there's a clear winner just to avoid traffic. And I think that's pretty telling, right. Uh, and it's exciting that EVTOLs can, 
uh, can, can provide, you know, a bit of the peace of mind to say, I'm going to watch it. This is what I came out here for. I, I want to see my team win. Um, and, and I don't have to stress that on the back end, I'm going to be sitting in a parking lot for hours. That's the entire Los Angeles Dodgers fan base, right? They show yeah. up in the second or third inning. They leave by the seventh. You know, <laughs> right. They, uh, they, they, they have a, a foo foo beverage in the middle, and the rest is just baseball. Like, and I, uh, think, yeah, I think a couple I selfies. Think, yeah. Right. I think exactly right. Like LA and like uh, Nashville, for instance, it's not just, I mean, there's so many events that occur in those locations that those, those things would never stop running because, you know, you look at one night in the week on a non sport night, and you'll have a concert at Bridgestone. You'll have a, a a different concert going on at the Titans uh, Nissan Stadium, and there's the Ryman, and there's all of these different venues in Nashville alone that even have a one central drop off spot in the middle of downtown. They're all within walking distance. But LA is the exact thing. That's a massively spread out region of ten miles of traffic, and you can't get a mile in an hour uh, with yeah. the amount of traffic in LA. But imagine if you could hop from you know, Dodger stadium to the airport or to, you know, whatever the venue is Disneyland for, for yeah. Pete's sake. I mean, you could do any of that and it's going to decongest the roadways and those companies are going to make a ton of money moving people around and they don't even have to charge the end user all that money like a helicopter provider would because of the the fuel costs. Um, and so it's really low maintenance, low fuel cost, and it's just, it's a good operating model for a, a busy area like LA or the big cities uh, specifically with all of those events every night of the week, uh, no matter what day it is, that, that, that's a great solution uh, to, you know, free up mobility. Um, even if it's not to the local airport, it can be from, you know, Disneyland to Dodger stadium. And you know, that's, you know, or to big parking structures or whatever that looks like in more rural areas. Um, well, it, it spreads out traffic. So I, th I think where my, my mind quickly jumps to, though, is, um, you know, I was really fortunate to have two great flights, um, one from Long Island right down to New York Harbor, where I got to go around the Statue of Liberty and do. I was really, really fortunate, especially after, uh, you know, 9-11. That's very rare to get to do that. I just was lucky enough to have a, an air traffic control contact that let me do it. And then flying from Northern California down to L.A., um similarly those are very heavy aircraft corridors and the air traffic control to get you to navigate through those spaces even in a cessna is pretty complex um for for trying to go into the where you've got like la you've got la um orange county burbank long beach those big heavy aircraft when i went down there i went ended up landing in a small airport in the inland empire um, and then again, when flying to New York, I was coming and going from Long Island. Uh, so to tr traffic in those high areas, like if you were to go from Dodger Stadium or uh, where the Angels play in Anaheim or, you know, any of those high traffic, how do you have corridors for that? Because um, I definitely had to stay in constant uh, communication uh, with air traffic control. I had to stay at a very certain altitude. I was very low flying and had to stay below the heavy traffic. And Jesse, so when you're talk to us about vehicle to vehicle communication, please, Jesse, because I, yeah, that, I know that I know that you're edging on that one and that you really <laughs> need to you really need to get that one out of your system. So go ahead. So that is the answer. <laughs> uh, vehicle to vehicle communications. Um, now, I am not in the aircraft industry. I've been in data. So uh, from a technical standpoint, there is a communication system through the FAA that is for fixed wing and for helicopters, and they all have their own system. From what I understand, the pathways for drone delivery systems today is untracked, and it is not a standardized system. So there is nobody that can point and say, well, we, we know Domino's is getting ready to deliver a pizza here, so we need to make sure that that does not interfere. What they hope is, well, when you take off from your helicopter, you're going to be at this elevation, and that's your elevation to play. Do whatever you need to do there. Same way with fixed wings. But what if you're getting up to that point, you do have a drone that has no idea, and you can't see it. Is that a potential problem? Absolutely. Yeah, so that's kind point. of when we're looking at this and going, what is the pathways for Tennessee? What is the pathways for other states? Is there systems out there? And unfortunately, 
Fortunately, there's no national system, but there is groups like North Dakota University that have the software that they've created to make sure that if you're here, you know not to get in these flight paths. And that's kind of the key to this is what is considered vehicle to vehicle or uh, uh, edged base compute. And then along with that, you have AI systems that are now having the ability to compute where you are in space and where they are in space. And now we're going to be setting up the protocols to where if you're a, a delivery drone that is dropping a pizza or dropping a box at somebody's door, you are you have to have give everything else the right away. And you got to know what everything else is. And that's the communication system that we're working on now is who controls that data? Where is that data compiled? And who is the one controlling what happens in those scenarios? Who wrote the code that gives instructions to say green light, red light to people and, and making sure that people's lives are always the number one asset that you have to protect in that uh, and, and it could be, look, you if you're a helicopter, you have to make sure that we know you're a helicopter right now. And that communicates with our drone delivery systems. And that way, when you're taking off, we don't have a pizza run into you or you cannot go near any aircraft facility. So you can't deliver a pizza at an airport because we don't want to even take the chance of a helicopter or anything landing or right. taking off with you in the way. So it's definitely a technological leap that we have to make, but the technology is here today. It's just putting the pieces together to where we have that system and then can build it from there on out. And I think that's why we don't see a lot of drone deliveries today. Yes, you have independent companies, but you know as well as I do, if I could drop a package in your front yard and that package delivery from, say, Amazon is going to cost 80 cents to do, and then I can come back and in two minutes have another package to deliver, that's what you're going to do. And the reason you don't see it is because nobody can control it. And the first time you put that package in front of a helicopter or any vehicle or any any type of aircraft and you hurt somebody, the the damage it would do to the entire industry would set it back probably five years. And so that's why they've not just done it yet. And I think that there's two pieces. I mean, right now the current system is the no fly zones around all of the airports and, and keeping, you know, where those planes are taking off and where the vertical takeoff and landing is approved through the FAA for no fly zones. And if you buy a residential drone, uh, and it's done correctly, it won't even allow you to fly into a no-fly zone. Um, and that's something that that's the current system. But the issue is with improved access to regional mobility, if you start popping up these hubs all over the place, then you wouldn't be able to fly a drone anywhere residentially um, because everywhere is a takeoff and landing port for these regional mobility solutions. And so the current setup to take off an airport from – uh, take off a helicopter from the airport is safe because there's a no-fly zone around the airport and you're not going to get impeded by a pizza delivery. But if you have a mile away a landing spot, a mile away a landing spot, these drones are going to have to be weaving in and out of these uh, no-fly zones in order to make it happen. Or you have to have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. And I know that there was some issues with the FAA approving out-of-sight uh, unmanned delivery. I was and just going to ask about that. Yeah. I think that that's something that's in like uh, in some aspects it's being uh, in, uh, improved upon and worked on and approved. Uh, but that's, that's something that has to be highly regulated because the moment I take a drone out of my site, it can do all sorts of damage if it's not regulated correctly. And that's where the vehicle to vehicle communications is the future of that. Because in a world where we flash forward 10 years, in a hypothetical situation and package deliveries are via a quiet delivery drone that will drop a package on your front door and pizzas will be delivered to your front door and Chick-fil-A will come to your front door. Um, and people are moving through air taxis in the sky and aircraft are taking off and landing. There's a lot more <laughs> use case of the skies and it will require a system that is telling everybody where everybody's at. And it's, pre-setting flight paths saying, I'm going from here to there in this airspace at this time and this other aircraft is communicating because unless you have that, it's just going to become more and more cluttered um, in the current system. And that's, you can't have a future without in that space. 
And a person isn't going to be sitting there at a desk looking at that drone and saying, okay, drone <laughs> A, you have yeah, permission no. to cross this flight yeah. path. So that's where AI is going to play a pivotal role in the ability to do D2D programming, which is in this case, device to device, but more than likely we'll have another acronym that is specifically drone to drone because even if you have drones out there and you start putting them in play some of these drones that deliver say a five pound package is going to weigh about 50 pounds if it touches another drone and falls to the earth and it weighs 50 pounds at 110 miles an hour you're going to have a risk to hurt a lot of people so does that mean that you have to have a parachute system in place does that mean there's so many things that that have not been identified that are problems with this. But the greater good for everybody is that their delivery system is much more efficient, much cheaper. And at any time of when you can get your medicine to you quickly and cheaply, and it can be done without you having to leave, that helps a lot of people out there that don't have and can't afford the abilities that we do, which is get out and go anywhere we want to. It helps in areas that have high congestion or in mountainous areas where you can't get through the mountains, say if it's snowed for three days, you know, in the Appalachian Mountains, there's valleys and <laughs> areas that when it snows heavy, you're not getting out for a few days. What if you need insulin and you're in one of these corners of the earth? Does that mean that you have the ability to get that? So the, the impact on everybody's lives is going to be better for this technology. How can we implement that? And that's what we are in the process of working with Dan and some others to create that uh, a pathway, especially in, in, in our region today. I think it's daunting. I applaud you guys for for having a passion for it. Like, I reflexively am am like s cynical because you talk about the greater good. We are not known to be a society that takes in consideration the greater good. I mean, you can look at just the whether it's nuclear, which this country for whatever reason uh, recoils. I, I shouldn't say whatever reason. We know the reasons. Three Mile Island, Fukushima, right? We understand the reasons, but those are really outliers. And the fact that nuclear is not like everywhere in this country is a travesty. The the reflexive politicization of of EVs, right? Like now in, in the hesitancy and the all the different anxieties about it, now you throw something into the sky and it's all of that, right? It's the greater good is, man, that's a big obstacle. It's not as, um, I think, instinctive as you'd like it to like to believe it. And certainly in our society, right? Where freedom, right? Like someone's going to get out a jammer. So you're going to have to have redundancy because somebody's going to not like that drones are delivering their neighborhood or their gated community or whatever it is right they're going to throw a jammer up and so you've got to have some what's the redundancy for that and to your point do you have parachutes we have and, automatic systems to drop bombs on those houses so it's fine <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. it, well and that, that goes back to your point christopher uh, how, how many times have we seen recently somebody sh showing a drone dropping a bomb what's the difference between that same drone dropping a medicine to somebody's house just because we had good intentions as a society or as a as humanity doesn't mean it's going to be taken just like the nuclear aspect and used for something that we don't want it used for right or just challenge. because it's up there don't mean somebody's not going to take buckshot and every time you you hear over your house they're going to take a shot at it i know that's going to happen a thousand times and they're going to say that's my airspace none of those pellets went anywhere else than where i wanted them to go in my area and how are you going to argue with that so it's definitely going going to be something that you're going to have to adopt what is the noise of these systems as they come over if you're living yeah. in an area noise pollution is pollution so is it yeah. something that you have to have certain corridors that along what we're looking at is potential to have interstate corridors that particular corridor is a good area for deliveries and that's some of the pathways that you'll take with these that way you're already masked by the noise you have there. Whisper Arrow has a wonderful aircraft product that is a very quiet, with their name Whisper, it's a very quiet motor. You know, there, I feel like there's technology that we can move in a direction to make the negatives positives, but the end result, if you're somebody that doesn't like these systems, but your life is saved because you got medicine when no one else could get you medicine, that's gonna change your opinion on whether or not you want these 
darn contraptions up in the middle of my air. So you and know, I think there's a difference between a residential drone as it sits now and the future of what will be these delivery systems that are much quieter. And, and I mean, I, that was one of um, Ian's prime points is, you know, if you're going to have a future of regional mobility it has to be considerate because even if, um, even if you're looking at these um, EV tall solutions, moving people around, that can be very noisy if it's not done correctly. Um, if you go, if you live near an airport, you know just how noisy airplanes and aircraft and jets and all of those can be. Um, and that's where we have to come up with considerate solutions if we're going to be putting a lot more of these into the skies via quiet. I mean, when you're dealing with electric, if you're driven by electric vehicle, you know. But when you're dealing with electric, it tends to always be more quiet. But the propulsion fans, which is something that Whisper is doing, is you know, is a silent mechanism but you're seeing some of these other faints i think it was joby that i saw a presentation on that we're talking about their noise profiles compared to um some of the other competition with drones and they are so much quieter because that's something that they're working on and so that that's something that i i think that the noise is going to play a, a difference with the uh, consideration aspect of of a lot of de delivery of packages and things because that just is going to heavily pollute the skies with noise around every ru rural area if it's not regulated with you know certain regulations of you drop out of this altitude uh to get in the noise range but then at that point you have to have certain noise considerations yeah but at the but, same time i don't see that a freightliner p1200 delivery band driving down your road with a combustion engine is going to produce more noise or less noise than a drone. I would think that the drone would produce less noise than the traditional way of yep. doing it. So that's the other question. If it's, you know, everybody can hear a van coming up and down the road or a trash truck or a tractor trailer. So if the product's getting delivered regardless, you do have an you do have a great argument to say, well, you have to make it quieter than today's system before it's something that isn't worse than what we have today. And you know, the, you know, those are some of the aspects of it. Here, here's your challenge though, and I'll just give you the full self-driving example as the obvious kind of elephant in the room, right? And Tesla. Um, Tesla has very quiet vehicles, and they they were actually the they solved it right away, right? Our our vehicles are quiet. But now you've got a challenge of the folks that are hearing impaired can't hear them when you're in a parking lot. They're dangerous at low speeds mm. when wildlife is is <laughs> jotting across the road. They never hear you coming. So deer and stuff have a lot of collisions because they don't hear these vehicles as they're driving. That's so, what the deer said to my truck when I hit it, for sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> It is, it is, uh, so, so this is, this is a challenge, right? Because it, it, in one aspect, you don't want this continuous hum of all these delivery vehicles in the air. And another aspect, as they're coming to, to land or to do something, you need to have people somehow aware of them. Um, somebody's going to argue either way. And then when it comes to the, the concept of look at all the advantages and the greater good, full self driving illustrates how that just gets thrown out the window because by all metrics by all metrics full self-driving is safer and better and especially if you get inner car car communication now does that mean full self-driving isn't going to drive you into a barricade one day or into the side of a truck one day <laughs> it, right but we will accept imperfection from an 80 year old grandmother who accidentally hit the gas and drove through a Starbucks. We don't like it. It's tragic, but we'll accept the humanity of it because we can relate to it. We all have a grandmother. We've all hit the wrong pedal. We've mm -hmm. all hit cruise control wrongly on our steering wheel when we meant to just turn the wheel, right? We can all relate to that. You can't relate to the drone in the sky that is supposed to be more intelligent than me failing even if it's at one one hundredth of the percent that a human does the moment that it crashes it ruins and you've got five hundred thousand full self-driving betas out there and they still every accident the first thing right is the evil technology the full that is your biggest obstacle is the humanity of it and that there's and no tolerance for technological failure when it comes to killing a human injuring a human and if if these drones collide with each other, if they get jammed, if they fall on somebody, God forbid, a child, yep. you know what I'm saying? Like it, it is it is a daunting, daunting task, I think, ahead of of the industry for that, because it's like I say, nuclear energy and full self driving are the obvious things that are giant benefits. All the data shows it and people don't feel that. So 
I think drones. I think, yeah, I think with full self driving, it's something that you're looking at. You know, user error uh, with other vehicles on the road. You're not seeing vehicle to vehicle communication yet. Um, yep. It's Tesla trying to predict the roadways, which is un unpredictable roadways with different road conditions and different um, road whether that's weather or road conditions in, in and of themselves. Um, but then they're not playing well with other vehicles. But in an in the airspace, one, it's all it should be other than weather. The the airspace in and of itself isn't a bumpy road, uh, if you will. Um, and so that's something that that helps you with the predictability of that. But every vehicle could then have a same standard. That is, if if you put every vehicle on the road full self driving with clean roads, uh, I guarantee you the system would be almost perfect because every vehicle knows where every vehicle's at. And uh, there's two differences there. There's two differences there. Full self-driving is one part of it. The communication between two vehicles with, with self-driving, that's not what's perfected today. That's, that's the part what I'm that saying needs is if they communicated there. to each other, you would never see user error because every vehicle knows where every other vehicle is. And they will know if that vehicle is trying to come into you so you can move out of the way. Like it, that's where the future has to be. But in the airspace, that's what we're talking about. We have to have that communication system where one drone knows where the other drone is through these communication systems. So that way it keeps the, the skyways clear. But Dan yeah, and we're not, speak. again, we're not. Yeah, poor Dan. Yeah, Dan's if like, this was a Google voice call, Dan would have his hand raised. Uh, very <laughs> right, polite, exactly. But, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I was just going to share there's, I, I, um, I, I was trying to, I was racking my brain for where I came across this, but, um, there was speculation that, um, that, you know, just like you're talking about the, the self-driving, uh, technology, uh, and certainly would have implications on the aviation side, um, that it's possible that as soon as, uh, 2050, uh, there may actually be, uh, measures passed where it would in fact be illegal to drive your own car. Um, right. Americans for, for, are going to go nuts. They, it's going to be, <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a lot of pushback against uh, a, a provision like that. Yeah. There would, uh, there would be riots in the street. I mean, they would just vote. <laughs> they would, they would recall and vote those people out guaranteed for, you know, everywhere between the coasts would just lose their mind. And, and even well, look, even even out here in California, though, in San Francisco, there was a famous incident within the past couple of weeks where a Waymo was lit on fire and vandalized and crushed. Right. And what what the quick clickbait articles don't tell you, and not that this is justified in any way, was that Waymo, because they've you know, they've got their pre mapped roads. Right. They they know exactly what it's supposed to be. What they didn't know is that this was Chinese New Year, Lunar New Year celebration a street celebration in the middle of Chinatown, right? So you have the, the, in the middle of Chinatown, one of the biggest in the country on lunar new years, a street celebration with kids and families and shopkeepers and everybody that had kind of made a street fair out of it. And here comes a Waymo making a hard left turn into a crowd of people into a, into a, into a, a very important one of the biggest celebrations to them, you know, from the people that I know in, in the area, it's their Christmas, right? That is the way Lunar New Year's is for this community. And here comes a Waymo, this technology, which is the antithesis of everything you're celebrating, which is, you know, generations and, and tradition. Here comes this Waymo tech. So they beat the heck out of Waymo, not just because it's San Francisco, which by all means is perfectly on brand, right, for, for, <laughs> for that to happen. But legitimately this waymo should have had a way to know that this isn't the day to go down that street there's a street celebration there or mm. when it comes to vtols hey we've got a incident here whether it's a fire or an emergency incident or a road traffic accident where now emergency services are involved and you have those no fly zones that are established around airports but what about the no fly zones that come up in 5 minutes because of an incident like how is that going to get communicated how is that street fair going to get communicated that's that's an Jesse's going to communicate it. <laughs> that that's that's what when, and that's the problem with not having a interactive communication system that you can then take considerations and then alter instantly. 
You know, now that is something where somebody should have said, hey, that street's going to be closed. Well, who told anybody that street's going to be closed? There's a permit that was done. It was advertised. Why didn't that machine know that that Not road to was going to be closed that day? And yeah. that's where you start getting into the Internet of Things systems. It, once you have an AI capable system, it will allow you to communicate that type of information at real time. And it will say, hey, this it's kind of like when you look at your map and you see red coming up ahead of you on Google Maps. You know that red means, hey, there's a slowdown. And then it starts changing your map to move you around it. That machine did not know that or it looked at it and said, OK, it's open because I see no cars on it. And that is just a learning experience that you have to learn from that luckily did not cost anybody's lives. When you start dealing with aircraft there's a potential there always. You, that's why you have double or triple uh, um, uh, uh, systems in place to make sure you don't risk anybody. So what you described is exactly the failure points that you have to have better than that. And I'm not saying AI is the all fix all, although when Terminator happens, then Skynet, <laughs> then, hey, guys, I'm OK. I'm on your side. But until that point, you know, you have to without AI, you're not going to be able to make these systems work. So that is a benefit of technology. How can we use it to help us? I don't know what the answers are going to be. Dan, uh, Josh, we don't know what the answers are going to be, but we are trying to at least provide the tools that are necessary to get to that next step to determine what the next road is. Then, then all the answers. We don't make any of it. Yeah. But we would support people who make it because those are the ones that that have the use case. Well, uh, we are. I, I'm going to interrupt us. We're running long. <laughs> well, just I'll leave you. I'll leave you with this. The uh, uh, the is it? Uh, I think it's is it Hanlon's uh, Hanlon's razor, which is never a tribute uh, to malice, which is adequately explained by stupidity. And I think that that is uh, that is where you you know to your point, Jesse. You've you, you need AI. You need something that is really redundant and smart because. These things don't happen out of malice. That that Waymo vehicle didn't come down the street out of malice. The the FSD didn't drive somebody into a, a white tractor trailer, you know, against the the white sky out of malice. None of these things happen out of malice. Um, it, it is the stupidity of the of the technology, um, and that is. And again, we accept that from humanity. We accept that we see stupidity in ourselves and each other and in people we care for. So that's more relatable. But technology is not allowed to be stupid, and so then they attribute malice to these things, which have no malice. They're and they're statistically better, yet. Um, but they are technologically still stupid, you yet. know. Yeah. Yet, yet. <laughs> well, I'm going to uh, close this down because we could talk about this for hours, and uh, we're, we yes. are already over an hour, and you know, I don't want to uh, keep our listeners going forever. But we will continue this conversation sometime soon with Dan. But I will let uh, Dan end us off with any final words that he might want to say um, as a uh, as a good note to end on. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's I agree. It's fascinating discussion. Uh, a lot of um, uh, it, it really makes us grapple with our humanity, uh, I think, is uh, in part, you know, your, your point, Christopher, Um for what it's worth, I mean, we're still very optimistic uh, about um, making use of, of this kind of technology for good. Uh, in fact, um, here on April 15th, uh, we're going to be publishing a special report uh, honoring the uh, our various first responders who are making use of uh, UAS uh, technology. Um, so certainly, uh, any listeners, if you know of a uh, of a first responder, um, you know involved in firefighting or search and rescue, uh, you name it, um, we would love to hear those nominations. Uh, we'll be selecting uh, probably around twenty individuals uh, to feature, um, uh, and uh, we'll start accepting nominations now. Where would they go to nominate? Um, I, I'll accept uh, uh, emails at uh, news in EWS at aaminstitute.org. Awesome. Well, we'll end it there.
I, I, I like I said, we could keep talking about this all day. I we appreciate you joining us, Dan. Thank you for the lively conversation. Uh, thank you everybody for tuning in today. Uh, feel free to like and subscribe if you're on YouTube and you haven't done that yet. Um, obviously, if you're still hanging around by this long, good on you. Appreciate appreciate the loyalty. So um, we will be back next week for more exciting news and information. Uh, and thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. All.